saved our sin-sick souls, that has reconciled us with our holy God through faith in Christ. Thank you for being united to Christ by faith and being a part of his body and even the local expression here at Grace Bible Church. Thank you for providing a house of worship where we can study the word of God, where we can sing our praises on the Lord's day and uh, where we can pray tonight. Thank you. Help us not to take it for granted. Uh, Might your spirit infuse his grace with our meeting together tonight, our fellowship in the word and our fellowship one with another. Uh, Thank you for fellowship with our triune God. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And while you're on your way to 2 Timothy 1, we started a study last week on historical theology, uh, which is just a fancy name for church history. We suggested several reasons why the believer in Christ ought to study the work of Christ in his church for the last 2,000 years. And tonight we want to give a biblical framework before we get into the first century. The first century of church history will be next week. Now, it was the early patristic church theologian Irenaeus who exclaimed, quote, we have learned from none others the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us. So he's referring to the apostles, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. So Irenaeus, early church father, is Uh, looking to the apostles who handed down the scriptures, which becomes the ground and pillar of our faith. We anchor our lives in the bedrock of God's truth. Now, having tried last week to whet your appetite for why study church history... Let Paul do a little bit of that right now in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, or as the Brits would say, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verse number 13, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the biblical framework we're going to establish. What I want you to do is, um, uh, I probably won't have, oh, actually I do have PowerPoint, don't I? I? I don't have a screen back there, but I got one up here. So, We'll kind of begin where I begin um, membership class with our theology of the church. And it kind of helps us practically see how our personal spiritual health is in correlation to the priorities in life centered around, the, around church life. And we don't have time to go back over, we, we broke the two-week membership class up into four different Wednesday nights. It's on our YouTube channels But there's a vital connection of the universal church that we're part of as believers and the visible local expression. As you get into a biblical understanding of the church, we picture the church as a building. One of the New Testament metaphors for the church is that of a building. Jesus himself promised to build his church and guaranteed that it will not fail. Now, notice Matthew 16, 18. Run from 2 Timothy over to Matthew 18. Um, I'm sure it's quite familiar to you, but just to remind you, Matthew 16, 18... Jesus actually here gives a promise about the church before the church is born in Acts chapter 2. Matthew 16, 18, 
He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, what rock? The pro- profession, the confession that, that Peter just gave, that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And it's on that rock, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this church that Jesus promised through the centuries to build uh, has taken over 2,000 years now. One of the metaphors is a building. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn to all these passages. You can feel free to join me there, but I'm not going to stick around there very long. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verses 9 to 11, we're told that we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He says in another epistle, Ephesians 2, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. He's talking about those that are saints, united to Christ by faith. You are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So again, this building, the church, is grounded on the foundation of the apostolic and prophetic teaching and Christ, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Well, it's not just Paul that uses this metaphor for the church. Peter says, in coming to him as a living stone, which is being rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. Peter continues in the next few verses to explain that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation stone on which the church is built. So the universal, invisible church consists of believers who have embraced the Lord Jesus in saving faith. They built their lives on the foundation of Christ and His Word. As Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, The winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Isn't it great when life is decimating all the obstacles and the affronts that when we anchor our lives on the bedrock, the rock of Christ, that uh, uh, come hell or high water, come the storms that blow, nothing's going to separate us from it. And so we, we build our lives on Christ, our lives are centered around His church, of which we are a part. That is biblical wisdom, friends. You even studying church history to encourage us, to inform us, and even warn us. Well, this building that has been being built by the head of the church, Christ, is built upon three doctrinal pillars that support and buttress and hold up the true church through the ages. That's what we want to look at. Three doctrinal pillars that define the true church. Following the metaphor of a building, we might ask, what are the essential doctrinal pillars that define biblical orthodoxy and characterize the true church church through the ages? There are three of them. True church is characterized by a commitment to the supremacy of the Word of God. In other words, the true church looks to Scripture as its final authority for doctrine, what to believe, and practice, that is how to live. Followers of Jesus submit to Him by submitting to His Word. A second characteristic is the sufficiency of the Word of God. The true church understands that the redemptive work of Christ accomplished everything necessary for salvation. To say that is to say that sinners are justified by God's grace through faith in Christ apart from their own merits or works. And third, the sanctity of the worship of God. The true church worships the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. In spirit, that's purity of devotion. And in truth, which is purity of doctrine. 
It, it rejects false forms of worship and repudiates anything that might distort or distract from its sincere devotion to God. So by contrast, the New Testament confronts and condemns those who would undermine the authority of Scripture, who would add to the gospel of God's grace, or that would contaminate the undefiled worship that God requires. So let's look at these three doctrinal pillars that help set up the, uh, the framework, biblical framework throughout church history. Three doctrinal pillars. The letter A is the supremacy of the Word of God. The true church embraces and submits to the Word of God. When we study church history, is it a church? Well, the question is, is the Word of God reigning supreme there? Jesus is the head of the church. His Word is the authority for His people. Paul highlighted both the authority and sufficiency of Scripture when he said to his mentee, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. On the contrary, false teachers seek to undermine the Scriptures. You think, for example, in the, in the book of 2 Peter, Peter denounced those who deny the Word of God by distorting its teaching or seeking to thwart its authority, 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. And the false teachers weren't just in Peter's day, they're in our day that continue to deny, denounce, and distort its teaching. In Mark 7, Jesus made it clear the Word of God is authoritative over traditions of men, no matter how uh, embedded those traditions are. When the Pharisees confronted Jesus because His disciples weren't following the extra-biblical traditions of first-century Judaism, in other words, what? They weren't ceremonial washing their hands and whatnot. He, uh, they, they rebuked Him, and so He rebuked them. So in Mark 7, 5 to 13, we're told the Pharisees and the scribes asked Him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why? Because tradition, in their mind, trumped the truth. How can they eat their bread with impure hands? He says to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So they may have done their traditions and they had really clean hands, but they had wicked, dirty hearts, hypocritical hearts before the Lord. Neglecting the commandment of God, Jesus says you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you've handed down and you do many such things as that. So as Jesus explained, the Word of God supersedes religious tradition. Scripture is the authority over tradition, not the other way around. Now that's important, an important principle for thinking biblically about church history. Because as traditions began to develop throughout the centuries, they must be evaluated through the lens of biblical truth. Because truth triumphs over tradition, not the other way around. So what about apostolic tradition? Certain segments of broader Christendom like Roman Catholicism and Eastern, Eastern, I can't even speak tonight, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, matter of fact, the town next door to us, Phoenix, and the town next door to me, next door to me in Rogue River in, over in Gold Hill have Eastern Orthodox churches. So, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy grew to elevate religious tradition to a level of authority equal to Scripture. Uh -uh. It's because their systems include beliefs and practices not found in the Bible. If we get too close to the Bible, it's going to have a spotlight on our traditions, and we can't have that, right? So to justify their elevation of religious tradition, 
They point to verses in the New Testament that speak of apostolic tradition. Obviously, they haven't been coming to the hermeneutics class. Some of you are, some of you are coming to on Tuesdays to learn not to cherry pick verses in Scripture to prove your point. So here's a cherry picking verse, 1 Corinthians 11.2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Later on in chapter 3, in verse 6, keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. So here you got three cherry-picking verses that they use. Tradition, tradition. Oh, don't get me into singing the old song from the musical. Um, while these verses mention tradition, do they really justify the non-biblical traditions that developed over the centuries in church history? To answer the question, maybe we ought to consider the following four points in your handout. That word tradition comes from the Greek word meaning that which is given over. That which is given over. The Latin word traditio means that which is handed down, and it's from the Latin word that we get the English word tradition. So when you see the word tradition in the New Testament associated with the apostles, it's not referring to some elaborate liturgical system of non-biblical customs like those found in Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy today. You know, if you go, uh, or should I say when you go to Israel, and you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where all these religions have claimed as their church, and you got to strip away all the incense and the icons and the traditions to get down to brass tacks, that this is actually um, Golgotha, where Jesus died, and you got to get a, uh, go back to the truth of Scripture that's revealed to us, not the tradition that entraps it all. So, what is this word referring to as it's used in the New Testament in context of the apostles? It's referring to apostolic instruction to what was given to the church, either through teaching and preaching or through their writings. Hence, we must not read later patristic and medieval customs back into the word tradition in the New Testament. To do so would be erroneous. Second item, apostolic tradition has been preserved for us in the writings of the New Testament. We don't have to wonder what the apostolic traditions are. When you read the New Testament, you find exactly what they taught. Paul may have been writing to saints at Ephesus or saints at Corinth or John to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Just because we do not live at Ephesus or Thessalonica, if it's written to the church, it's written to the church that came after them. It is to them for us. We don't need to wonder what the content of apostolic tradition was because it's recorded. When you evaluate extra-biblical tradition in light of the New Testament, we're bringing the authoritative instruction of Christ and the apostles to bear on that tradition. We're right to evaluate anything that claims to be apostolic against the standard of what we know to be apostolic and authoritative. Is an example by the apostles? Is it a command, a teaching, preaching from the apostles? Said another way, we ought to evaluate extra-biblical tradition against the standard of Scripture because Scripture is the apostolic tradition. Number three, 
believers are instructed by the New Testament to evaluate all teachings and traditions in light of God's Word. How often the New Testament repeatedly warns the church about the threat of false teachers as if the church didn't believe it. Paul didn't even leave the church at Ephesus before he rallied the elders around him and said that the, these wolves are going to come up from among your own selves. There were actually wolves in the first century erecting themselves against Christ. Paul urged the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, examine everything carefully. He said to the, the saints at Colossae in Colossians 2.8, did I get that reference? Um, in Colossians 2.8, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according th to the tradition of men. Let's pull over and park here for just a second. We avoid the errors of false teaching and heretical traditions by carefully examining everything according to the standard of divine truth, the Word of God. Uh, you, in our scripture reading that we've been doing through Acts, we read about the Bereans who are more fair-minded. Why? Because they search these things to see if they were true. Do the traditions, are they consistent with the apostolic tradition that's been handed down in, in Scripture? See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. You know, I've got a uh, friend and fellow biblical counselor recently this week, uh, it must have been Monday or so, uh, posted Colossians 2.8 on social media, uh, which caused Christians to think. And simply after posting the verse was the question, what elementary principles has the world believed? And what deceptions have they swallowed? Is, is the worldly wisdom that's been swallowed that discipline is bad for kids? Even though Solomon says that if you don't chastise your child, you hate them. Or that humans evolved over millions of years. Or that happiness is the end game. Or maybe we've imbibed that Christianity needs to be deconstructed to be relevant or that love is love. We hear that when we're out doing evangelism. Uh, my body, my choice. Or that women are fighting for their rights. Or one of the greatest battles that has infiltrated and crept into the church, that of the worldly wisdom that comes through the world of psychology. You know, there's a lot of talk bantered on the internet right now, uh, especially in circles that we run in. Uh, those of you that were in the recent uh, biblical counseling class were here when we threw the DSM manual under the bus because what drives things to be put in the DSM, which uh, is used to discern mental illness, is not driven by pathology, but by committee votes. Well, I guess we'll include this one, and these we will not include. Matter of fact, I was listening to a... Uh, really good sermon yesterday by Dr. MacArthur because at a Q&A recently, he almost broke the internet when some stuff that came out of his lips was dismissing worldly wisdom. I've gotten my computer bag over there, uh, a book that was very helpful to me years ago where you've got the professionals that spent enormous time and money drinking from worldly wisdom like Dr. Richard Gantz was a practicing psychologist for years. A lot of my friends right now are talking with some of these people who aren't even believers but are now admitting to the poisonous scam that they've been part of for, for decades, 50 years or so. And so Paul says, test everything. Examine everything carefully. Make sure you're not taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. You know, when, when I read for us 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given for these express purposes, when he talks about inspiration and sufficiency of Scripture, it comes after his warning about false teachers. 
So what's the antidote to false teaching? It's the Word of God. That's the only thing that's going to keep us healthy and help us to see error from the truth. Believers can differentiate between truth and falsehood by evaluating it in light of Scripture. Are they empty traditions or are they apostolic ones? Even Paul invited that kind of scrutiny. That's why Luke can say of the Bereans who heard the teachings of Paul that they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examined the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so, Acts 17, 11. Though he was an apostle, Paul welcomed the Bereans' eagerness to test the veracity of his teaching against the standard of written revelation. You know, contrary to the Catholic Church during the medieval ages that took the Word of God away from the people, what is the position of Bible expositors? Chapter and verse. Like, use your Bible. Look on your lap to see if what is coming forth from this pulpit jives with apostolic tradition. We welcome that. We evaluate extra-biblical traditions through the lens of Scripture. We're doing exactly what the apostles tell us to do in the New Testament, to examine everything carefully and do so by searching the Scriptures. So we can safely say that any tradition that fails to measure up to Scripture's standard is neither apostolic nor authoritative. And the fourth, the early church viewed the writings of the apostles as inherently authoritative. They understood any non-biblical traditions must be evaluated against the standard of Scripture. Now, I opened up our lesson tonight with an example from early church theologian Irenaeus. So I'll skip over him here. Just a century and a half later, Basil of Caesarea talks about his theological battles against the followers of Arius a false teacher that denied the deity of Christ. Notice what Basil said. I do not consider it fair that the custom or tradition which obtains among them should be regarded as law and a rule of authority, of orthodoxy, excuse me. If custom is to be taken in proof of what is right, then it's certainly competent for me to put forward on my side the custom which obtains here. If they reject this, We are clearly not bound to follow them. Therefore, let God-inspired Scripture decide between us and on whichever side be found doctrines in harmony with the Word of God in favor of that side will be cast the vote of truth. Unquote. So for Basil, when it came to conflicting traditions between the followers of Arius and the defenders of sound doctrine, the solution was to look to the Word of God. Scripture is the umpire over tradition because it tri- uh, trumps tradition. Only what accords with the Word of God can be considered true. We could give so many examples through church history, but we have to move on. Let me give you a second pillar that the church has stood on through the millennia, the sufficiency of the work of God. So we move from the Word of God to the work of God. Now, when we're talking about the work of God, we're we're speaking specifically of the work of salvation as false teachers add some form of human effort and achievement to the gospel. We understand that sinners are justified before God on the basis of grace alone. It is by grace man is saved. It is by grace man is sanctified. The biblical gospel asserts that sinners are justified before God on the basis of His grace alone. Salvation is the gift of God received through faith apart from our works based solely on the finished work of Christ. End of story. In response to those who tried to add self-righteousness works to the gospel of grace, Paul issued the sternest rebuke. In Galatians 1... Verses 6 to 8, he said, I'm I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. Now, let's stop for just a moment and think about this. Paul hasn't even died yet. 
and they're following, uh, falling for it. They're falling for a different gospel. He said, which really is not another gospel. Only there are some who are just disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or some angel from heaven should preach to a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be anathema, accursed, damned. In Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, when the Philippian jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul's response was simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and your contribution, right? Is that what your Bible reads? Not at all. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Emphatically stated. In his letter to Romans, the the saints at Rome, Paul reiterated the idea that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, Romans 3.28. He gets to the next chapter, Romans 4, and he presents Abraham as the example of being justified by faith. Abraham is the poster child for one being justified by, by faith. He gets to chapter 5, and he reiterated that because we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. Isn't it great that we can never be more loved by God and there's no more confidence that I, I've trusted Christ, I'm at peace with God. Everything is right in this, well, everything is wrong in this world, but everything is right in my soul. Consider some of his other statements about God's grace and salvation. Romans 11.6 If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. You add anything to grace, it undoes grace. It tarnishes grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. In other words, Paul was relying on a righteousness outside of himself, the righteousness of Christ. Paul, throughout his ministry, emphasized the truth of the gospel because he saw what was at stake. Third pillar through church history is the sanctity of the worship of God. We move from the Word of God to the work of God, to the worship of God. The true church worships the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in both purity of devotion and purity of doctrine. They go together. Conversely, false teachers either distort the truth about God or introduce competitors to the pure worship that He alone deserves. Remember when Jesus shares the gospel with the woman at the well, John 4, 23. He said, an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So in John 4, 23, we see that the worship of God requires both spirit, that's devotion, and truth, that's doctrine. Just think about those two facets right now for a moment. Purity of devotion, undefiled worship is reserved for God and God alone. That means it removes distractions and rejects competitors. When uh, the ark of God is taken captive by the Philistines and put in their false temple, and they come back the next morning, Dagon's on his face, right? And you see the satires of Isaiah and Jeremiah where they're kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek taunting all the idols because God requires purity of devotion. The Old Testament is replete with mandates regarding the exclusive and undistracted worship that God is rightly due. According to Isaiah 42.8, the Lord's jealous who does not share His glory with any other. Second commandment, condemns those who worship idols, including those who would create a graven image for the people to worship. That does away with icons as well. 
One interesting Old Testament account involves the reforms made by King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18.4. We're told that he removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. The bronze serpent that God commanded Moses to make for the Israelites in Numbers 21 had become an object of veneration for them by the time we come to Hezekiah's day. You know, I mentioned the Church of the Holy Sepulchre earlier. Um, if you go there where they believe is where uh, you've got Golgotha where Jesus died and uh, there, is, there is a glass enshrinement which people were bowing to and kissing when I was there because people were chipping away pieces of the rock. This is holy rock that we want to take home with us because that's what people do. That's why the, the, the tablets weren't maintained or anything else because we just worship it because that's what we do. In the New Testament, all forms of idolatry similarly condemned. So purity of devotion, second of all, purity of doctrine. Undefiled worship requires an accurate view of who God is. Last year, or maybe it's been two years, when we studied the doctrine of God, and we'd uh, brought up some, uh, some great quotes that I, I wish I could spit out right now, but my brain's not working. But any view that the church has of God who is not how He represents Him in Scripture is an idolatrous view, and He won't tolerate it. Various heretical groups, they deny the deity of Jesus, they reject the truth of the Trinity or teach that there are many gods. The worship offered by these groups is false worship because their understanding of God is erroneous. Numerous scriptures we could turn to make the point. How about in 1 John 2.2? 2, 2? Oh, I did flip the slide. 1 John 2.22. 2, 2, 2, who is the liar but one who denies that Jesus is the Christ this is Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Uh, John's not beating around the bush when he says that. This is Antichrist. Later he adds that those who deny the humanness of Christ are also false teachers. There's a re response to the ancient heresy called Docetism, which taught that Jesus' human body was just an illusion. It denied the reality of His incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we've got to be right about His deity, and we've got to be right about His humanity. Against the error, John writes in 1 John 4, 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. So if they're already in the world at the time of Paul and John, they've been around for a while. John adds that the true church is one that embraces the Lord Jesus as God's Son. 1 John 5.20, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And if we had time, we would uh, open up to the Gospel of John and see what he says about his deity and, and Jesus' humanity and his Messiahship, but we must uh, move on. How about we put a handle of application on our study for the night to take with us? If we extend the building metaphor to the whole of church history, we might picture the centuries after the apostolic age as the superstructure of the church, fulfilling the promise that Jesus is going to build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It rests on the foundation of Christ, the Christ of the Gospels, in other words, and continues to be defined by the pillars of biblical orthodoxy. <clears throat> so applying the principles... Regarding the supremacy of God's Word, Scripture alone is our authority. Is that simple enough? Scripture alone. 
regarding the sufficiency of God's work. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works, based solely on the finished work of Christ. Is that clear? Know it backwards and forwards in your evangelism. Number three, regarding the sanctity of God's worship, we're called to worship Him in purity of devotion and purity of doctrine. So, beloved, consider personally, individually, what corrections you may need to make to put the authority of Scripture and the accuracy of the gospel and the authenticity of worship into practice more consistently in life as church history continues to be written in our lives, should Jesus tarry. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for a rich heritage that we have gleaned over these last 2,000 years, ever since Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost. Lord, I, I look forward to our study next week where we look from, from Pentecost to Patmos with the last living apostle. There's so much to be said, and we're just, we're just jumping across the tiptoes of the, of the tops of the trees of church history. But might we glean rich truths to encourage us and rich truths to warn us for the glory of Christ, the head of the church, we ask it. Amen. Pauline, did uh, Steve send any questions?